I'm going to talk to you about UDL-based computer science education, as you just heard. Um, and what you may be wondering is why I'm talking to you about computer science education at a conference around universal design for learning. Uh, and what I hope happens in this session is that you can see that because computer science education in K-12 is such a new area of pedagogy, we can, from the very beginning, design instruction tools pedagogy, professional development around UDL. So we can study and really see how does this emerging area of learning, um, if we proactively think about universal design for learning, affect learning in an area of instruction that traditionally many kids have been left out of. So that's, that's my goal for kind of making the connection between computer science and also the other content areas. So I'd like to make this a little interactive. Um, and this is not my idea. I actually got this from a colleague of mine. Um, what I'd love for you to do is to tweet about this. Tweet about how this connects to the things that you're doing, um, what questions you have, what wonderings you have, um, how, what resonates, what's confusing. And then afterwards, what I'm going to do is look at those tweets and blog about it. And then we can continue the conversation. So use the UDL IRN hashtag, but then also use hashtag cs for all And if you use, um, at MIsrael09, then I'll be able to find it easier. But um, I hope you play along, because I hope this will be fun. So why does this matter? Um, I look at computer science education in K-12 as an equity issue. Um, typically, students who have gotten enrichment have had access to computer science. Students whose parents have the funds to send them to after-school programs and camps have access to computer science. Students who struggle academically are typically assumed to not belong. And so if we can consider how to teach all kids, then we're able to provide them with the opportunities that they should have access to. Um, the other thing that we mentioned is that the lessons that we're learning in computer science education, I think, apply to the other content areas. And we certainly borrow from what everybody's doing in math and science and literacy in the context of computer science education. So I see this as a loop. Um, and the third piece is that one of the criticisms we get in the work around UDL from teachers, from administrators, is, well, what does this look like? Can you tell the story of what this means in my second grade math class or in my AP biology class? So I think it behooves us to tell these stories and to explain very richly what does UDL-based instruction look like. And so I'm using the context of computer science education to do that. OK. So I look, this, I look at this as a fragile opportunity. Because computer science in K-12 is very new, we could do this really well, or we can completely <laughs> go off the handles and do a terrible job, and all of a sudden our students who struggle academically will continue to struggle the way they have in other content areas. So it's very fragile, and this time right now, where we're just now getting into schools and districts are saying yes, all kids, is an amazing opportunity. So it really is advocacy-based research. We're doing research to show if we have the right instructional practices in place, all kids can be successful. So just for context, how many of you feel like you understand what programming in K-12 looks like? OK, a few. So I have a slide for context. Um, so in K-12, there are two basic kinds of programming environments that we use. One is text-based and one is block-based. What we typically know when we think about computer programming, we're usually looking at this text-based language, right? A lot of um, numbers and letters and notations. So this is an example of a text-based programming language. It's called JavaScript, and this is something from um, Khan Academy. The other kind of programming environment that we use a lot of time with children, and actually not just children because some universities are using Scratch in higher education, is block-based programming languages. And essentially what you're doing is you're dragging blocks of code and connecting them like puzzle pieces, and then you're able to run the code. So essentially you've got this very visually intuitive programming environment where kids don't have to memorize what the code is, they just have to recognize the code. So those are the two kinds of environments. There are affordances and challenges to both. And there are also questions about how do you transition children from one environment to the other. Uh, but we have to do the work in both areas. One of the things that Seymour Papert used to talk about is having an environment that has a low floor. That means everybody can enter, 
right? It has a high ceiling. We can get as far as we want to if we are interested um, and we are motivated to do so. And it has wide walls, which means that within that we can tinker and we can be creative and we can just have fun. And so within, within all of those, I think from a UDL perspective, low floor, high ceiling, wide walls fits really well. And that's one of the places where we can make connections between computer science education and universal design for learning. How do I design instruction so everybody can walk in? How do I design it so that they can be successful and meet their full potential? And how do I provide opportunities for kids to be creative, to problem solve, to experience frustration, all within the learning environment? Okay, so we have this mandate, see us for all. There are lots of different organizations that are doing so. How, right? This is the big question, right? And so from a UDL perspective, what we're doing is we are crowdsourcing the how. We're working with teachers, we're working with um, coaches, we're working with administrators to tell the story of within the context of second grade computer programming using the scratch programming environment or using a different one, what does this look like? What are some ways to have flexible instruction? And at least right now, it's just a living uh, Google Doc. <laughs> so we're having all of these ideas and teachers are adding to it. And eventually what I'm hoping happens is that we get to link it to, um, to those instructional practices. So I'm gonna just give you a few examples. Um, one of the things that happens in computer programming is that usually there's some kind of task. You want the children to learn something. Rather than just having one task, we decided that all of our tasks are gonna have four options. So one, so this particular game is a cat that needs to catch the mouse, and when the cat catches the mouse, the game is over. So I'm actually using my mouse to move the mouse around. And so um, the first method is I'm just going to play this code. The code is created already. I can remix it. I can modify it or just use it. Students can do that if they want to. The second is that I can have that same code but have it not work. Uh-oh, I got to debug that code. And once I debug it, it's able to work. The third is what we call exploded code. So remember I told you about like these big blocks that fit together like a puzzle piece? What if I have all the puzzle pieces there, but they're not in any kind of order? So I have to put them in order so that the, the program word works. Or what we call, this is a friend of mine came up with this term, a spicy expansion, right? So let's just say I already know how to play this game. Why don't I add some additional features into it so that then it, I can maybe add some scoring to it. So I'm not telling you to do one thing and you to do another thing. I'm saying we have all these options and you can toggle between them. Uh, because the goal here is to have kids learn about sequencing, have kids learn about um, conditional logic, have kids learn about decomposition, and they can do it in any of these options. All right, thank you. Um, another example is a lot of the platforms that we use actually have some really good features in them, and so we wanna show teachers how to use those. So for example, Google CS First has amazing supports in them. So in this one, for, there are worked examples, and there are video tutorials. And so a lot of the platforms that we work with have features within them. And I think that applies in other content areas. I think about math curricula that have games, that have a lot of you know, worked examples. How do, do we work with teachers to embed those into their instructional planning in a way that is flexible? So in this particular example, the students are asked to create some kind of scenario that's happening in a dark and stormy night. And they could do whatever within them. But having a video tutorial for how to make the rainfall Having a video tutorial for how to make the sound of the rain is important. Uh, another example is creative problem solving. So what we can do with computing is leverage how motivating it is for kids. Kids really like to play, they like to create. But if I need them to learn about fractional um, number parts on a number line, I would really love to see what they learn by animating a story that has a number line and they can put their fractional parts on here. So right now, here's an example of a student who had a monkey on a magic carpet ride or another one where there are snowflakes going from tree to tree. Having kids be able to have a flexible way of demonstrating their understanding is super important and is very helpful. 
So we have these ideas. We think that it's helping. We're working with teachers. We're doing professional development. Um, we need to study this, right? So we have two different ways of studying this. One is to look at teacher implementation, and one is to look at student learning. From a teacher implementation, what we have are all of the teacher's lesson plans. Uh, we're working with instructional coaches. So all of the coaching logs. We have um, student or classroom observations, and we have teacher interviews. So we're able to triangulate that to look at what's actually happening in classrooms and what teachers know. And then what we do is we code them by the UDL checkpoints. And we're able to see, here are the kind of things that teachers think UDL in this context look like. What are the gaps, right? So do we have areas where the teachers feel very comfortable and other areas where the teachers actually do not? Um, in this particular study, uh, we saw some really great um, lesson plans, but huge gaps when it came to assessing. How do I assess learning in a flexible ways? Is this an issue that other folks have seen around here with UDL? Yeah, assessment is tough, right? So when, then we're able to do additional professional development and look at um, these um, instructional practices to see if they improve. The second thing that we do is we look at student learning. Um, and there are two ways we do it. The kind of the fun new way that we're doing is that we're doing video screen capture. So I can see everything that's happening on the student's computer screen. I'm able to see um, what they're working on, what's frustrating. Are they using the instructional practices that we're teaching them? Um, are they improving in terms of persistence and problem solving when the teachers are implementing the strategies that we're hoping they're implementing? And then we're able to create some nice visual. These are like. This is an emerging area. <laughs> so, so we're looking at different kinds of visualizing that data. So directed graphs. In this particular directed graph, you have the 0 to 12, which is a student who's working independently. We're not seeing a lot of independent persistence here. Uh, we have a whole lot of collaborative interactions. So this is a directed graph of a student who gets stuck and immediately asks for help. Asks for help from peers, asks for help from the teacher. And then we can look at the video and see what is the teacher doing, what are the peers doing. And then we're looking, I'm actually trying to create some timeline visualizations too to see how much time they're working independently and how much time they're working collaboratively. Uh, but this is a emerging area because um, as it comes out, data visualization is really complicated. So we're, um, we're working on it. Uh, so those are the diff two different ways that we're looking at data. I wanted to show you a couple examples of what we look at. One, because I think it's really cute and fun. And two, because it'll give you some context. So let me give you a little bit of background. So remember I showed you the Google CS first tutorials about the dark and stormy night. This particular student wanted to tell a story about a penguin in the rain who says, I need a jacket because it's raining. Um, she is sitting next to another student. Both of these kiddos um, had learning disabilities. Um, they were sitting next to each other on their own because a lot of what we do is we, we try to teach kids how to work collaboratively and we teach them very explicitly some strategies for collaboration. Um, but we don't tell them, you know, you have to sit next to this person or, you know, um, you're going to work with a student who's at this level or not. Um, so the goal was to animate the penguin in the rain. And what you're going to hear is some serious frustration. So if you don't mind. Hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? What, what's the matter? Is there some it's glitching. It keeps on glitching. Just stop, stop, stop. What do you have for your coat? That so far. Okay, for the rain. For the rain, please. Let me see if that's the same coat I have. No, for the rain. It's because I'm trying to make sound. Rain sounds. Oh, uh, that's too many rain sounds. Just letting you know. <laughs> that's too many. And it, yeah, the penis. What will happen? Uh, it will like kind of glitch, I think. No, because I. I wish my dad was here. It's not working because it's glitched. Okay. Frustration, right? And actually, I think that. It's a wonderful opportunity to have kids experience frustration, 
right? How do I get to solving a problem from a position of like, I don't know what to do. So I love these scenarios. I don't love that the student is frustrated, but I love where we can go with a student who just feels completely helpless in solving a problem. Um, I wish my dad was here, right? That's like, I can't do this on my own. I need somebody else to do this for me. Um, just so you know, for context, um, there's a block there that says forever. And the way this, you can't see it very well, there are a bunch of different sounds in there. And they're all supposed to be playing at exactly the same time. So if all of us were talking at exactly the same time, what would we hear? Chaos. So that's what's happening in this situation. The student is just hearing this like chaotic sound that does not sound like rain because there are too many sound blocks in there. So, oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. So what, this is the same student. It's further along. And uh, the teacher recognized this frustration. Now, we've been working a lot with the teachers on think alouds. We've been working with them on real world examples. And we've been working with them on reflection. And so what you'll see here is that the, student, the teacher is trying to problem solve with the student and kind of talk them through this idea of what would happen if we all spoke at the same time. And so let's see if we can get that. And then you have to take some, but why? Because it wasn't too much, it was nothing. Glitching? It was glitching? How was it glitching? It was glitching. What did it sound like? All of the sounds were playing all at the same time, weren't they? Can you imagine if four of us all tried to talk at the same time? Would you be able to hear anything? Okay. Same thing in Scratch, right? How many sounds was it all playing at the same time? And um, like six. Yeah. It's all going all over each other, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah? Are you done with it? You want a badge? All right. You gonna write for me? I'm gonna write one new thing that you learned. Do not put lots of blocks in the same thing. Do not put lots uh, of blocks in the same thing. <laughs> All right, so you can hear that thinking and internalizing that the teacher is doing with the student. What we don't want to do is we don't want the teacher to give the answer to the student, right? So we're working a lot with trying to empower the students and to give them agency. Um, and so this kind of process that we're working on with the teachers, um, we found to be very successful. So um, I'm just going to see here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, this is just a um, journal page from the student. Um, do not put lots of in the same thing. <laughs> Um, so what's interesting to know is that that actually there's some additional misconceptions that are going to happen there because you could actually put a bunch of different blocks within that repeat loop. They just can't all be sounds. And so we have to think about how do we actually um, move beyond um, this particular type of reflection. And that's okay. Um, we're, still, we're working on it. It's a work in progress. So here's my big so what to kind of end and hopefully message this right is that across all areas, including computer science, we want to provide opportunities to help teachers um, empower their learners, right? How do we give them the tools to know what universal design for learning can look like in their own instructional planning? Um, and then we want to see to what extent is that being implemented in the classroom? What kind of tools are teachers using? Are they actually using the all of the you know, options within those tools, as I, you know, I was thinking about what you were doing, um, what kind of materials, what kind of supports do the teachers need in order to be able to provide that level of instruction. Um, so I hope that what you'll see from this is that um, what we're learning in computer science education hopefully can apply to what you're doing. Um, and as a small plug, if computer science is happening where you are, um, are kids with disabilities and all kids being included? To what extent do the teachers have the tools? So that is one of the things I would love to hear more about or to give you some of the um, insight into what we're doing to be able to advocate to make sure that all kids are getting computer science. Okay, thank you.